Ho, ho, ho. Chase ghosts. ghosts. Come sleep. sleep. Watch out. Demons are coming. Run. Sleep. Hide. Spirits. Run. Ghosts. Ghosts. Hide. Ho, ho. Demons. Ho, ho. Ghosts. Demons are coming. Welcome home, my little hellhounds. Tonight we have five scary stories to sink our hellish teeth into. If you have any scary stories you want narrated on the channel, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares. Also, if you like this content, then don't forget to subscribe and if you would be so kind and click that like button it will be very much appreciated now let's get right into it My daughter talks to her shadow, posted by Legacy of Potato. When my daughter started talking to her shadow, I thought it was just some sort of weird game. She didn't have many friends, so maybe this was her way of coping. It was honestly kind of sweet, but it soon started to become strange. She would talk to her shadow for hours on end and soon it began taking up the better part of her day. Whenever I suggested talking to it less she would become sad, even angry. There's one incident I'll never forget. I was in the kitchen preparing us dinner. She was in the living room talking to her shadow as usual. Something about that particular conversation seemed different. She sounded as if she was trying to keep her voice down, as if they were exchanging some sort of secret. What are you two talking about? I asked. She got quiet for a moment, then kept on talking to her shadow. Weird. But alright. I kept preparing dinner until I heard it. A low, gravelly whisper. I spun around, trying to locate the source of the noise. I knew that voice wasn't my daughter's. Could it have been the shadows? Of course not. I was just hearing things. I didn't hear any more whispers that month, just my daughter talking to the shadow. Recently I became concerned, she would only talk to her shadow and nobody else. I decided to take her to a child psychologist. I managed to convince my daughter to go after much badgering. She never wanted to leave her shadow, but I told her it would be there keeping her company. When I picked her up from the psychologist's office, her eyes were bloodshot and she was sniffling like she had been crying. She was muttering things to her shadow. Hey, um, are, are you okay, honey? I asked, concerned. She responded by shaking her head, no. What, what, what's wrong? She said nothing and continued whispering to her shadow. I sighed quietly. As soon as we got home, I decided I couldn't wait any longer. I had to know what happened at that appointment. I had to make my daughter speak to me again. What happened? What did she tell you? I asked desperately. She ignored me and kept whispering to her shadow. Honey, please, just tell me. Nothing. I stormed off to my room in frustration. 
I collapsed onto my bed with a sigh and took a few deep breaths, trying to compose myself. You bitch! Startled at the sudden voice, I stood up and spun around to look at the source of it. Behind me was a grey, shadowy figure that was my exact height and build. I looked at it in disbelief, taking a step back. What's wrong? Can't handle finally seeing us. The figure taunted, drawing closer to me. Its voice sounded exactly like mine. What are you? I whispered in shock. You don't get to speak to me, or to any of us. Not after the way you've treated us. You, all of you, have been ignoring and taking us for granted for centuries. It slammed me to the wall. And the second, that girl, bless her heart, acknowledges one of us. The first thing you try to do is stop her. P -p please, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. An apology can't make up for this. Without warning, it scratched me viciously in the chest, forcing me to drop to the floor. Ever since then, I've left my daughter and her shadows in peace. I cancelled future appointments with the psychologist and never bothered her about it again. It's what our shadows would want. The worst day off from school ever. Posted by MTP6921. My mom had to go to work at the grocery store today and school was just cancelled because of the impending snowstorm. So I saw my mum in the bathroom putting her makeup on and trying to call whoever she could to help watch me. I'm only a nine year old girl and she doesn't feel comfortable leaving me home yet. She started calling the parents of the kids in my class that I really didn't know, which was really embarrassing. And finally, she got Ali's grandmother to agree to watch me. My mother jotted down the directions, which don't seem far from our house. Maybe I have said hi to Ali once, so I knew this was going to be a really awkward experience. My mum pulled up to Ali's house and she was already 10 minutes late for work so she couldn't even knock on the front door with me. So I reluctantly got out of the car and my mother said, I'll pick you up later Grace, I'll see you hun. Ali lived with her grandmother in this creepy old house on this busy road and this house must have been like 200 years old. Then she drove away. I heard car after car go whizzing by as I walked up to the front porch of the house. I was just so terrified because I really didn't know Ali that well and I didn't know her grandmother whom she lived with. I slowly took little steps on the concrete ground of the porch. I got to the wooden white door that had multiple brown and yellow spots all over it and a four pane window that was fogged over so I couldn't see inside the house. I stood at the door for a few moments really not sure what to do and then the coldness made me feel uncomfortable so I knocked on the door nobody answered so I knocked again and still there was no answer I felt really overwhelmed so I started to cry then I heard footsteps coming towards the door from the inside and the door slowly opened a woman with white hair said oh hello I said hi I'm Grace she responded, How are you? 
I didn't know what to say, so I said, fine. She then said, come in dear, and then she closed the front door which led into the kitchen. There was a small bench in the kitchen, so I sat on the bench and took my jacket off. My mother thought I was too young to have a phone, so I had nothing to play with. I just sat there, with no toys to play with or TV to watch on the kitchen bench as the grandmother tended to the pots on the stove. The grandmother had white hair with yellow streaks from years of smoking. She had kind of an old mean look to her, but she could be kind of nice if she wanted to. The grandmother just ignored me and I put my hand on my forehead knowing that I had at least four more hours until my mother was going to pick me up. I was going to ask the grandmother where Ali was, but she walked out of the kitchen in a quicker pace for an old woman. I could hear her feet stomp as she walked. Then she went up the stairs in the same stomping fashion. There was silence for a moment. Then, at the very top of her lungs, she yelled out, You son of a bitch! What did you do? I told you not to do that. My whole body froze because I've never heard anyone talk like that before. Then I heard those same thumps coming down the stairs. I wish I could just run home, but I don't know how to get home and my mum would get mad at me. Then she came back into the kitchen and I was breathing really heavy. As she got close to me, she said, Can I get you anything, dear? I was too frightened to say anything, so I just shook my head no. She continued to stir her pots that were boiling now. It kind of smelled like tomato sauce that my mother would usually make for me. All I could think of is the book that mommy read to me called Hansel and Gretel. As I watched this old woman stir her three pots while I just sat there motionless. There is a clock on the wall and I notice only an hour has gone by and I still have three more to go. The old woman continues to take the lid off of each pot to stir what's inside, then close the lid and go to the next pot. I really have to pee, but I don't want to say anything. Plus, I'm too scared to get up. I keep wondering, why doesn't she ask me if I want a TV, play with Ali or something as I just sit there. I think to myself, maybe Ali is punished to her room. There's a window in the kitchen as I watch the cars fly by and the snow start down. I start to hear little footsteps coming from upstairs and the old woman stops stirring and gets this really mean look on her face as she listens to the little footsteps. I just sit there in absolute fear as I watch the old woman stew in anger. Then I could tell she had enough and she quickly walked into the other room again. You could tell she had difficulty in walking from old age, but she was just so mad and was determined to get to the stairs as quickly as possible. It sounded like she stopped short of going up the stairs Then she started yelling and screaming at the top of her lungs again. I told you to stop. You don't know how to listen. Don't make me come back upstairs. She continued with a verbal barrage. Then she came back to the kitchen. I was crying at this point. She either didn't pay attention to me crying or she couldn't see me from having poor eyesight. She continued to stir her pots with such vigour like her life depended on it. She just seemed like she was so mad. I really didn't know what to do because I really had to pee and I still had a little over two hours to go before my mom was coming to get me. Then it happened again 
where I heard those little footsteps coming from upstairs. I just held my breath because I was so terrified in what this old woman was going to do. The old woman listened again to the footsteps and this time she was beyond angry, angrier than the time that I took money out of mummy's purse without telling her. The old woman took off her apron and rolled it up into a ball and then carried it in her hand as she angrily walked out of the kitchen. This time she stomped all the way up the stairs. Then all I heard was the same loud yelling that sounded like, I told you, you son of a bitch. Then it sounded like someone was playing the drums with stuff being thrown everywhere. It just sounded very angry and very vicious. Then it got completely silent upstairs. All I could hear was the pots boiling. I kept looking at the clock and I've heard nothing for the past 20 minutes besides the pots boiling. I really had to pee and the room next to me looked like a bathroom. So I got up and quickly ran to the bathroom. Thankfully, it was a bathroom that had a small pink carpet next to the toilet and the toilet lid had pink carpet on it as well with a cushioned toilet seat. I quickly finished peeing and hurried back to the bench in the kitchen. The old woman still hasn't come back yet. Everything is still silent besides the sounds of the boiling pots. The snow is continually coming down and I only have an hour before my mom is going to come pick me up. Then I hear those little footsteps again coming from the upstairs. This time I'm scared of those footsteps because I'm not sure if they're from Ali, the old woman or something else. I just continue to sit on the kitchen bench as frightened as ever. I thought to myself at least I could see the old woman and be afraid of her but it's all been well over an hour haven't seen her as I continue to hear the footsteps I muster up enough courage and say Ali it's me Grace are you there then the little footsteps stop and I hear nothing I don't know if Ali knows that I was even here or not as I sat silent in the kitchen the whole time as the little footsteps stop I continue to hear the pots boiling and I see the snow coming down the old woman still hasn't come back yet and I only have half an hour left before my mum comes to get me then out of nowhere I can hear a car traversing through the snow and pull into the driveway she's early but I hope it's mum, so I get up off the bench and look out at the kitchen door's window and I see her car. I grab my coat and open the door and quickly run to my mum's car. I was overly emotionally crying. I explained everything to my mum and she tells me that if I have school tomorrow to talk to Ali and to see if her and her grandmother are okay. My mother explained to me that everyone has different parenting styles and every household is different and for me just to get me grateful that Ali's grandmother allowed me into her house I had a two hour delay the next day and I was really worried about Ali also I didn't sleep very much because I was still so scared of everything that happened at Ali's house I ran into Ali at lunchtime and I said to her, I just want to say thank you to you and your grandmother for letting me stay at your house yesterday. Ali replied, me and my grandmother waited for you all morning, but you didn't show up. I thought we were playing the snow or something. A strange happening posted by Black Cat 
1206. One day, my cousins and I were playing in the back garden. It was a warm, sunny day in mid-July. The air was kind of hazy and full of the sounds of summer. Insects hid in the long grass just outside the boundaries of the safe garden. The garden and heath ran right through without a fence, gate or any other type of barrier, dividing our private back garden to the public, very busy heath. For example, if you were playing in the back garden and a random person walked past on the way to the heath, they were clearly visible from anywhere within the vicinity of the garden, as well as being very audible, even down to the point of if the person knew our family, they were able to conduct a simple conversation with whatever kids were playing there. Gran always told us kids that the area directly outside the limit of the garden was strictly forbidden and because she knew us three girls better than the back of her hand this statement came with an extremely stern warning that if this rule wasn't followed we would all receive smacked bottoms. We all abided even though the three of us had adventurous spirits. At the time of this incident we were all playing on the crazy paving path that our builder uncles had made to make it easier for my wheelchair to run safely along the ground. As I played with the other kids, Elle was pushing me as fast as she could and I in turn was pushing the ancient family pram that had been there longer than any of us had. We were playing mummies. As usual, being the oldest, our cousin G was mum and and picking flowers for the milk bottle in our tree slash bush house. It was more a cluster of bushes at the bottom of the garden with a clearing which was easier to adapt into a wheelchair accessible tree house where all us kids played at one time or another. Suddenly there was a sense of not being alone. I think Elle and I both noticed this at the same time because we raised our heads and looked in the exact direction where the creeping feeling resonated. Just outside the back garden's entrance stood a strange looking figure. We all said after the incident that the figure appeared to be a middle aged stocky man dressed in shabby dark clothes. He called out, hello, how are you? We didn't answer as we usually did to passers-by who we knew. The stranger continued, I've lost my dog. Have you seen a little white dog? Being ever protective, G answered curtly, No, no we haven't seen any dogs at all. The stranger didn't look at G but kept his attention on L and I, although he did respond to G's remark, Oh dear, Will you help me look for her? She's not very old and she might be lost. She couldn't have gotten far. I automatically begin to feel uneasy and I knew Elle felt the same too as I felt her pull my wheelchair back. I let go of the pram even though we were a good distance away from the stranger. The stranger was motionless throughout this discourse. Indeed, it was eerie how still he was. G just turned 11, was adamant. I'm sorry about your dog, but we can't help you. We aren't allowed to leave the garden. The stranger remained still and measured. Come on, you won't be away for long. I will pay you five pounds if you help. Just then, our older male cousin came around the side of the house pushing his bike followed by a family friend who also lived at the house. They had both returned home from work. Our attention was momentarily distracted away from the figure by their sudden arrival and when we looked back in the direction the stranger had been, he had completely vanished. 
Seeing his sister, G's perplexed look, our cousin H said, What's up with you? We all excitedly told H and our family friend about the strange happening and the man. Well, the family friend, slightly unnerved by our account, rounded the three of us up and hurried us inside. H immediately marched out of the back garden in the direction of where we said the man must have gone, cursing under his breath about dirty old men perving on little girls. Only to return 20 minutes later, hot, bothered and cross. Were you three having a laugh or what? He said angrily. There wasn't a man on the way I went in fact. I never saw anyone at all. It's too hot to play stupid games, little brats. The three of us were obviously indignant at this slur, as we had all seen and spoken to the same man. Later, when we were in the bedroom with my mum, she asked us about the incident. I still often talk about that day with my mum and cousins. We still have no idea where the strange man could have gone or who he was. Moonlit Highway posted by bloody spaghetti I haven't driven a car in a while I kind of can't bring myself to do that anymore I used to be really confident behind the wheel and really good at it too now I can drive I can't sit behind the wheel to save my life I just can't the last time I drove was when I was taking Eric my older brother from some party he had attended. He got pissed drunk and knew he was in no state to drive halfway across the country back home. That's why he called me. I had to drive halfway across the country to get him and then make the trip back home. We stopped at a town called Kalia because he had to throw up again. As he was relieving himself, I was watching the beautiful scenery of the Dead Sea. The desert and the mountains around this area look especially beautiful during the night. The moonlight illuminates the rocky terrain in a beautiful shade of gold one could stare at for hours. As Eric was done throwing up, I looked up at the end of the road and saw something peculiar, a person a person racing down the road on foot. Now it's a long winding road that stretches across the whole desert and there isn't much traffic there most of the time so a lone skater wasn't out of the realm of possibility that however was approaching us way too fast to be a skater by the time this person was close enough to be clearly seen, I could tell it wasn't any old skater. The guy, judging by his voice, was clad in a black suit and had some very strange shoes that looked more like miniature rockets than shoes. He had a slightly elongated helmet on. He must have caught my bewildered gaze when he glided past my outlander and stopped a couple of meters behind me. What the? I questioned loudly. Oh this? Just a little piece of new transportation tech my family is developing. The man said as he lifted his visor revealing wrinkly skin and these old hazel eyes. Wow that's cool I quipped genuinely intrigued. Yeah, the man answered, approaching me. How fast can you go? I questioned him as he stood right in front of me. With the right gear, 
up to the speed of sound. Like this, fast enough to leave you and your cart in the dust, he remarked with the utmost confidence, even though his speech sounded somewhat childlike and slurred. He sounded fairly sure of himself. I'd prove you wrong, but not today. I'm taking my drunk brother home, I said, just as Eric came out of the bushes in which he discarded his party edibles. Did I hear anything about a race? Who's this guy? Eric motioned with his finger to the stranger. You have weird eyes, man. Weird, I tell you. My brother continued as he stood comically close to the stranger, barely able to keep his posture. I was just inviting your brother to race me, but it seems like he can't, the stranger quipped. Sure he can whoop his ass. Ben, show him what you got, he urged me. Where's your car, by the way? Eric asked, looking at the stranger nearly falling on his face in the process. The guy pointed at his shoes and said, These are my wheels. Whoa. Eric blurted out, You sure about this, bro? You're throwing up from me going slowly. I don't think you could... I was cut off by my brother. I'm fine, I've emptied my stomach. Now let's go whoop some ass. He called as he waddled towards my car, making his way there without falling. He sat inside the crossover and slammed the door behind him, yelling, Come on now. We ain't got all night. I sighed. Fine. How far do you want to go? I looked at the stranger who was making his way towards the front of my car. To Ein Gaidi. That should be far enough. That far? It's half an hour away. Are you... Sh I was cut off again, this time by the strange man. Time depends on velocity. Now come on. On the count of three, we start off. The stranger demanded. His voice was still filled with confidence and pride. Eric was shouting something in the background I couldn't make sense of. His alcohol fueled rambling. I sat down in my seat and ignited the engine. I pressed on the gas pedal gently, making the outlander roar as the engine warmed itself up. The stranger spread his legs wide with one leg, being positioned strangely behind his body. He turned to face me and raised his hand with three fingers pointing upwards. Three, two, one. He yelled out, go. That turned into a low barking sound a millisecond before my engine let out a deep mechanical growl and we both took off. I saw the stranger beside me one moment and he was gone the next. I was ahead of him. I kept on pressing the gas pedal until he became a tiny black spot in my rear view mirror. Not one to underestimate competition. Even if I had the race won, I kept my speed in the 120s of KPH. The road turned to a blur of grey beneath my vehicle. The mountainous view turned into rising and falling blotches of brown and gold on both sides of my car. Eric was yelling and cursing in the back seat. I was confident this is going to be an easy one so I just sank into the mundanity of the empty night road as I pressed on. Suddenly, I could see a person on foot approaching me. My heartbeat rose. The guy could indeed go up to 120 on foot. I was getting excited as the man kept gaining up on me. I kept one eye focused on his ever approaching silhouette and the other on the road ahead. Soon enough, he was at arm's length of the tail of my car. That's when I slammed the gas pedal down to the floor and sped off again, going up to 150. I've lost the man. Got him, I yelled out. <laughs> ben, Eric called out meekly. Sup, I said as I kept pressing the gas pedal. He's catching up. 
my brother remarked. No way. I thought, no way this could be possible. Then I looked at the rear view mirror and he was there, catching up to the car. Son of a bitch. I hissed under my breath and pressed the metal down to the floor. The moonlit highway turned into a mess of colours where darkness twisted into light and vice versa. The surrounding mountains turned into a continuous line of brown and gold. The moon seemed to stretch infinitely and the road became almost a tunnel in my eyes. Even the utility poles and road signs seemed to merge with the overall blur around me. The speedometer was pointing at 180 kilometers per hour. The skater wouldn't let up though, he kept catching up. He repeatedly outran me before lagging behind. We played this high speed game of cat and mouse with me pushing the pedal as hard as I could. The speedometer turned up to 187 kilometers an hour when the car started shaking noticeably. Eric opened his window, letting the shrieking wind in. I couldn't hear a thing. All I was focused on was outrunning this strange man on rocket boosters. He kept tagging me, however. No matter how fast we went, no matter how the road twisted and winded ahead of us, the skater maneuvered himself as gracefully as a gazelle within a high speed sprint. Even though this was a marathon, Eric started shouting something, but I couldn't understand anything beyond if sound between his drunk screams. Eric, bro, I can't hear a shit. The wind is too loud. Then I lost the strange skater one last time. Sighing a sigh of relief, I nearly lost control and flipped the car over when I heard a loud thumping sound echo through the vehicle a minute or so later. The car bounced slightly and my heart skipped a bit. The adrenaline rush turned into a panic. My heart started to go so fast it was beating, probably faster than my car was going. My vision narrowed and my hands clasped tightly around the steering wheel. I lifted my foot slightly off the gas pedal and let myself slow down a bit. At that moment the stranger came out of nowhere from behind me and bypassed me with insane ease. I cursed before chuckling when I could see him in front of me. My adrenaline fueled overly focused vision allowed me to see something about him. He seemed to glide above the road as opposed to sliding on its surface. I knew at that moment that he had me beat and I didn't press the gas pedal as hard anymore. The stranger seemed to get further and further into the distance before turning into a black blur that disappeared in the night sky. I drove on for a few more moments before finally reaching the agreed finish line. The stranger was waiting there for me. This time he held his helmet in his hand my heart dropped to my shoes as the hairs all over my body stood up. What took you so long? The stranger said as he approached the car. I, I, uh, I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. The whole situation was just too bizarre. I, we, I stumbled over my syllables and the most basic of sounds. It was a good one. I had tons of fun. We should do it again. The dog rat thing with dry wrinkled skin said, wiping saliva off of his hairless mug. Y y yeah, was the only thing I could manage to get out. My eyes were fixed on its ugly inhuman form as it walked or slid or glided or whatever it is that it did. My lungs burned and my head was starting to spin from the lack of oxygen. The creature walked to the passenger's door, opened it and placed something inside, exclaiming calmly, I think this belongs to your brother. A wet slapping sound came from the back of my car as the creature laid whatever it is in the back. He closed the door shut and bid me farewell before sprinting off into the darkness once more. 
I sat for a long few minutes trying to digest what I had just witnessed. Nothing seemed to make sense. My mind was not registering things properly. Everything seemed to blur into a soup of thoughts and sensations that made very little sense. After a few minutes of sitting silently in confusion, I realised my brother was silent for the longest time. He was never quite drunk unless he was passed out, that is. There was no way he could pass out during such a roller coaster of a ride. The car was shaking a few moments ago and he's been silent for longer than that. The door just slammed right next to him and he's always been a light sleeper. Eric, I called out. Silence. I turned my head around only to see my brother slumped in the back seat of the Outlander, his shirt bloodied. I gagged audibly because Eric's face just slid off of his head, landing on the car floor in a wet splat. The Rotary Phone, posted by MTP6921. I looked at that damn phone every day. At one time it was as yellow as the sun, but from all the years surrounded by cigarette smoke, it's now almost like a faded mustard coloured yellow. I know I'm the only one in my 19136 zip code that still has a rotary phone but I have it for only one person I wait for a phone call a call that I haven't received in close to 10 years but I know it is coming any day the phone call that will warn me that they are coming the ones that I owe millions upon millions of dollars to the ones that I thought I could just win one more game to be even. I was a high roller and at one time I lived the high life but for the last decade I've been hiding out in this dank 1970s horribly decorated house knowing the one person on the inside of their organisation would tip me off if they found me. You see, he's my father and though he's close to 80, he's still my father. A father who didn't know me growing up and only found out through Ancestry.com that the fling, who is my mum, unknowingly got pregnant and learned that his son, that his son, he's a degenerate gambler. To make things worse, I live alone with my 13-year-old daughter, Grace, whose drug-addicted mother left when she was nine. I know this organisation and what it's capable of. I've made a fool of them and they will kill me and my daughter in a heartbeat if they found out where I lived. I was fortunate that my father gave us this place to hide out. It was actually his mother's, who was my grandmother that I never met. He told me the organisation We'll never look at this house because they don't know our relation. My father has done well for himself where he's a capo that has many soldiers that report to him and my father reports to an underboss but as high as he is and given that he is a made man they will also kill him if the organisation finds out he's hiding me. I had done too much and shamed the organisation's reputation. My daughter's name was once Sophia and I had to train her to go by Grace, which is really hard 
thing for a six-year-old kid at the time to do, especially considering that her crack-addicted mother left us a few years later. I guess there's an argument who is a bigger degenerate between my gambling self versus my crack-addicted wife. So I sit in this old house every day and I never leave. I get everything delivered to my front door. Grace goes to school every day and is a good student. I warned her that we might have to move one day. If Pop Pop ever called me, my father won't come to this house with me here. Once a week, Grace goes to visit my father at his house. It's a pretty elaborate setup where Grace purposely walks the long way to the subway to see him. She doesn't know everything regarding my situation, but she knows that if she doesn't follow Pop Pop's directions, then her and I will be harmed. So every day I'll watch the same damn TV programs. I can't even go outside, because if one person recognises me, then I'm done, and I have to be close enough to answer that phone. That phone will work under just about any circumstances. It will last another 50 years if need be. I know if Grace was 18, my father would just have me killed for her sake. But with his emphysema, he doesn't have long to live and she doesn't have anyone else but me. But I know she would be better off without me. All I am is a ticking time bomb an unpaid debt to the most savage organisation in North America. But if I don't leave the house, they won't find me, and I keep telling myself that. My poor mother knows what I have done, and she knows that she can't ever see me again, or Grace. I usually hang out in the kitchen, or in the living room, where I can hear the phone ring. About once a week, I have a mini heart attack, because a telemarketer will call. I usually yell and scream at them and I tell them I'm on every do not call list, but they still call. I sleep on the couch every night. I've been doing so for so many years that I'm used to the couch. I'm sure my grandparents purchased the couch sometime in the 1970s with its Halloween orange faded tone which feels like wool against my skin. I could hear the phone from upstairs, but I don't want to chance it. I don't want Grace to wake up with a knife to her throat, so I sleep on this uncomfortable 1970s couch. My father could upgrade the couch, but in a way it's almost a punishment and I deserve it. As long as he takes care of Grace, I'm fine with whatever. I'm a different person now. I don't have to gamble 10 times a day anymore. I don't have to gamble on Sunday football all day, then watch international soccer and gamble on sports clubs that are probably fixed to win or lose regardless. I'm just not that person anymore. I feel like I was when I was 16, when the world meant something more than a quick $5 bet here or a double or nothing there. I feel like there's so much more to this world that I'll never have a chance to see. I sometimes wonder if prison would be any better because then at least I would get to socialize with others. But if the organization didn't get me on the inside, then the day of my release, they would have got me then. But. I have to do this for grace because this life isn't for me anymore. I choose my lot and I have to live with it. Every time she comes through the door, that's my sunshine. Every time she leaves for school, then I know she's growing. Sometimes I have panic attacks and I have to remind myself that nobody knows I live here and grace is just a child of an unknown tenant whose landlord just happens to be a capo. The worst part is, 
I can't even watch sports anymore. What the hell is the point of January without football playoffs? Or March without basketball playoffs? Or February without the start of baseball spring training? I live in a living hell. I'm just trapped in here all day. If Grace brings one of her friends home, I hide in my room so they can't see me. But I make sure I can still hear the phone. I've become an expert on World War II movies. I know everything from The Battle to The Bulge to D-Day. I've seen every black and white and modern day war movie. I guess there's no harm in wars because the winners and losers are already known so I can't gamble. Most of the times Grace will just see me for like two minutes out of the day. She's busy with her own social life. I cook her whatever she wants and she likes me for that. We can't go shopping so my father just gives me his Amazon card for her. He's really specific for me not to buy anything for myself and I wouldn't cross him. Even as old as he is, he has that certain toughness. He was a marine in the Korean War. You just don't cross him. But in the Sicilian traditional family comes first. And that's the only reason why I'm alive. Grace is actually the only reason why I'm alive. My father knows I'm a dead man. When he dies, he knows I'll be killed. My father has been creating a smoke screen for me and any credible leads on my whereabouts, he just squashes it. I'm just a headache for him, but there's no alternative for him because of Grace. I could tell every week that my father was getting closer and closer to death based on Grace's description of him. Then one day I heard that sound that haunted me for years. The sound that would wake me up at 2am in the morning. But to find out, it was just a nightmare. It was that damn yellow phone ringing. So I ran from the couch to answer the phone. I reluctantly picked up the phone. And with no greetings, my father gave me an address to meet him. At this old abandoned warehouse. This is the most horrifying scenario. Because I knew he was going to have me whacked. But what do I do? Do I? I can't refuse to go. I haven't left the house in years. So just the thought of that frightened me. I had no choice. So I got on the subway and headed towards the abandoned warehouse by the river. I know he made an arrangement for mine and his life to be safe. For Grace. It was the only logical solution considering that once he died I couldn't support her. But taking the subway to my own execution to save my daughter didn't make my nerves feel any better. I was given no information but logically Grace would just live with my mother and my father and I would be tortured and mutilated. It has to happen if not now then her and I would be essentially starved out of the house. As I sit on the subway, I look at all the beautiful houses and trees and remember what the world once was. It kills me that I can't even say goodbye to Grace, but it's for the best because I would start crying and she'll remember me in that state for the rest of her life. I know my stop is close. I wish the subway would go slower but the inevitable is approaching. I hear the automated conductor announce the next stop and I know I have to see myself as a piece of meat, void of all feelings, like a pig who is being trucked into the slaughterhouse. I caused enough grief and potential harm onto Grace and this is one of the last things I can do for her. I know I only have to walk one more block. I see the warehouse. My mind blocks out the weather because it just doesn't matter. If I get hyper, 
or hypothermia. It just doesn't matter because in 30 seconds, some olive skinned man with a five o'clock shadow is going to shake my hand, then rip out my bowels. I see four cars parked outside the warehouse and I head for the only door that I can see. I take a deep breath and then I step inside. I close my eyes briefly as I open the door almost to brace myself for impact. As I open the door, some man looks to be about 46 with some kind of unknown accent, maybe Norwegian, says to me, I'm Special Agent Olsen with the FBI and we're here to offer you safety in the Witness Protection Program. In the corner of my eye, I see my father and I know that Grace and I will be safe. that's it for tonight my little hellhounds thank you for listening if you have any scary stories then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares and follow me on twitter at home of scares good night my little hellhounds